The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Jesus said to his disciples, In those days after the tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from the sky, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the end of the earth to the end of the sky. Learn a lesson from the fig tree. When its branch becomes tender and sprouts leaves, you know that summer is near. In the same way, when you see these things happening, know that he is near at the gates. Amen, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have passed away. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But of that day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father in heaven. The Gospel of the Lord. Good morning, everyone. Once upon a time, a Catholic priest, a Protestant minister, and a Jewish rabbi were very close friends. They did a lot of things together, and when they'd go out, for instance, bowling, the Catholic priest and the Protestant minister would tease their Jewish friend about becoming Christian. They'd keep telling him, you know, you need to come to the true faith. So finally, he decided to get even and so one holiday season, he sent out a card to his two friends, and it read, Season's greetings. Roses are reddy, reddish, violets are bluish. When the Messiah comes, you'll wish you had been Jewish. <laughs> Today in our church throughout the world, as we approach the end of the calendar year, we always hear from one of the apocalyptic sections of the Gospels. Now remember that word apocalyptic means special revelation. And it's found here in Mark chapter 13, Matthew 24 has his apocalypse, and then in Luke 21. But what's interesting, John completely omits any language about the Son of Man coming at the end of time, or as far as that goes, the world coming to an end. He totally omits it. And there's a reason for that. But now it's interesting, there was a movie that came out, uh, in fact it was at the box office this weekend, uh, called 2012. Did anyone go see that movie? Okay, one, two. Okay, well, it's not worth your time, actually, right? <laughs> it's a movie about the end of time, and I found it very interesting. I don't know that it's coincidental. They would happen to open that movie when the Catholic Church is talking about the end of time, because probably somebody who was Catholic or is Catholic in Hollywood came up with the idea of releasing it at this time. But anyway, as the storyline goes, it's about uh, the end of the world as we know it, and it's based on a very curious event. The Mayan people, their calendar supposedly runs out in the year 212. And so when their calendar runs out, that's when the world runs out. So I don't know that I would be buying that theory about the Mayan calendar. But one thing I do know for sure, one of the basic teachings of the Catholic Church is that the world as we know it is going to come to an end. Now, what does Mark have to tell us? Well, he opens up by having Jesus give us an interesting collage of Old Testament scripture quotes that have all been woven together as one. This little section about what's called the tribulation uh, is, is fascinating. We hear from Joel chapter 2 verse 10. We hear from the prophet Zechariah chapter 2 verse 10. We hear from the book of the prophet Isaiah chapter 13 verse 10. We hear from the book of Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 3. And then finally from the book of Daniel chapter 7 verse 13. 
And they all have the same language talking about all kinds of cosmic phenomenon that are going to take place before the end of time. And so Jesus will use that language and any Jew of the day would have been familiar with those words. And then he goes on to say, after that happens, then you will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds, escorted by the angels of heaven, and he will dispatch his angels to all the ends of the earth to gather his chosen people. He will bring them all together with him. Now what's interesting, Mark's not the first one to come up with this concept. We actually find it as well in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verses 15 through 17. There Paul writes this scripture for a group of people who are worried. They know that the end of time is going to come. The Lord has only been dead about 20 years. And so what they're worried about is that when he does come back, what happens to our loved ones who have already died? What about the ones who are buried in the ground? And so Paul describes this scene where they're going to be sucked up from wherever they are and gathered together to the Lord in the clouds and they will be with him forever. But what's also interesting is the fundamentalists all around us use this for the backup scripture for their teaching on the rapture. <coughs> Have you all heard about the rapture? I mean, yeah, you probably heard about it. I hear a lot of talk about the rapture. Actually, the rapture is an incorrect interpretation of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Because the thinking is in the rapture, yeah, the Lord's going to come and he's going to suck people up into the heavens with him. But in the fundamentalist interpretation, only a few are going to make it. Only a few that they call the elect. The rest of us, well, when the Lord comes, we're going to have an immediate heat sensation. Uh, that's supposed to be funny. <laughs> it's going to be very warm, Bill Muth, wherever you are back there. The text from Mark contradicts that. The Lord is going to gather all of his people up. And in Matthew 25, which one is, was one of our basic texts in Catholicism for the interpretation of the final judgment, all people all people are going to be gathered before the Lord. So it's not a whole idea of only a few who will be chosen. All his people will be gathered before him. And then Jesus goes on to talk about the fig tree, a little parable, if you will, of the fig tree. And what's interesting, in Palestine of Jesus' day, and it's pretty much the same way today, most of the trees in the area are evergreens. They're green all year round, except for one very noticeable exception, the fig tree. The fig tree was very significant back then because of its fruit. But what happens with the fig tree, come the fall, the thing withers up and dies. And so comes spring, when it comes back to life, it's very noticeable because the leaves turn green and you see buds all over the branches. Jesus says, you know, if you can notice what happens to the fig tree that signals the end of winter and the beginning of the summer growing season, then you'll know the signs when the end of time comes. And then he goes on to say, this generation will not pass away until all these things have happened. And he goes on to say, you know, heavens and earth is going to pass away, but my words will never pass away. And then the disciples turn to him and say, when, Lord, is it going to happen? When? And he says something that the fundamentalists miss. Jesus says in Mark's gospel, no one knows, not even the Son but only the Father in heaven. No one, not even the Son, only the Father in heaven. So for those who would predict the, 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 the coming of the end of time based on an increase in hurricanes and tornadoes and volcanoes and all these natural phenomena, they chase after these things, they get very worried about these things, 
and we always need to go back to the words of Jesus. No one knows. So what can we say about this very important passage? Well, first and foremost, Mark did something that he does a few times in his gospel. He made an oops, a mistake. He made a mistake. And what is that mistake? He had said and pictured this whole saying about the coming of the end of time as something that was going to happen as a result of the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. In fact, in this passage, not in the verses here, but in chapter 13, Jesus will say to his disciples, the temple is going to be destroyed. In fact, he says so devastatingly so that not one stone will be left upon another. And you know, that actually happened. It was the result of, of an uprising that took place beginning in 66 AD by the Jewish people. They had gotten tired of being occupied by the Romans. And so a few zealots took up a fight against the Romans and then more people got involved. And Rome got tired of fooling with this bunch of, of people. It cost them money to, to keep the supplies and the troops in the area. And so Caesar called in one of his great generals, a general by the name of Pompey, with the orders to take a reinforced Roman legion to the area of Jerusalem and level the place. And in the year 70 AD, he did just that. It was a horrible massacre. One Jewish historian who survived it, who was an eyewitness, a man by the name of Josephus, wrote that literally not one stone was left upon another. It took them 46 years to build this structure. It was beautiful. It was adorned with jewels, for goodness sake. But when the Romans got done with it, it was a pile of ashes. And they massacred men, women, and children. The Romans did not take prisoners. So those that were able to flee went up to the northeast to a little town called Jamia. Now, if you were a Jew living in that area and you heard about this happening, it would be the end of time for you. For you, it would be horrible. It would be like for we Americans hearing the, the news that the terrorists blew up our nation's capital. It would devastate us. It would be a huge psychological blow and God forbid it would ever happen. But that's how devastating it was. But guess what? The end did not come. It came for thousands of Jewish people, but it did not come. More time would have to pass. And so what are we to make of all of this? What does the Catholic Church say about the end of time? Well, first and foremost, the basic part of our teaching, based on the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 1, verse 2, is that we do live in the final age. We are the last generation. And what does that mean? We're not talking about in terms of hours and days left. In the author of the Hebrews thinking, Jesus' death and resurrection was the last offer to God to our world. That was the final word. In fact, he says it. God has spoken finally and definitively in the death and resurrection of Jesus. The offer of salvation is on the table for all of us, in other words. And so, we are living in the final age. As the church teaches, we expect no new revelation from God. Jesus was the sum total of revelation from God for all time. We must listen to him. But he will come at the end of time. And when will that be? No one knows. Not the Son, but only the Father. So what are we to do in the meantime? Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 28 that we await the consummation of the world in Jesus Christ. Or in other words, for Paul, the world is going to come to an end, but before that happens, all things must be made subject to God through Jesus Christ. Or in other words, Jesus and his death and resurrection are the news that we must turn our lives to the Lord our God. And so, for some reason, the Lord is still taking his time 
in bringing the end of time to us. What do we do in these in-between times? We work. In a few verses that follow right after our current gospel, Jesus tells a parable about a servant and, and a master. He says, once upon a time there was this master who went off to a faraway place. But before he left, he went to each of his servants and he gave them a task to do. And so Jesus says, like those servants, make sure your work is being done for when the master comes back home. We have work to do, each and every one of us. God has given us talent and he expects a return when he sends his son back for us. And so for the true believer, it's not a time for living in neuroses or anxiety. It's not to be, to meant to be a frightening and fearful time, as the fundamentalists tell us all around us. No, for somebody who's done their work, someone who has been faithful to the Lord, it's meant to be a joyful time, a time of hope when our master comes back to take us where we were meant to be from the beginning. So my brothers and sisters, no need to worry or be fearful. The end of time is going to come. This 33rd Sunday is a reminder once again of that very important teaching. But it's also a call to discipleship. We have no time to waste. We have work to do. And let us pray we will do that work so that when the Lord comes, he may find us prepared and joyful and ready to receive him.